Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. Roy Prevo is an international speaker, best-selling author, and a futurist who studies disruptive technologies and their effect on human behavior. He is the author of the soon-to-be-launched book titled Control Your Controllables, colon, Seven Steps to a Life of Serenity and Peace. As an anxiety sufferer, Roy has uh, suffered this disorder and developed strategies to diminish anxiety in his life and his workplace. He teaches anxiety sufferers how to think and not what to think. If you have questions during Roy's presentation, please type them into the chat. And at logical breaks in his talk, I will interrupt and pose your questions. Roy, are you ready to take it away? I am. She's all yours. Let her rip. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm setting on the timer here because I know that uh, I have 60 minutes and typically I can uh, I go on longer than that. So welcome everyone to pivoting from anxious to high performing. And I was quite intrigued with some of the responses when Roger was asking about uh, how COVID has affected them and whether they feel any anxiety around this. So I just want to kind of set the bar on this. If you are a consultant, a coach, um, um, you know, somebody who deals with the public or, or has um, any kind of engagement, uh, your, your role from this day forward uh, while we have COVID among us, is to, um, you really have to chat with your customers and your potential customers. And part of the conversation should be around your ability to give them some level of uh, serenity in, in their workplace. So you just might want to, I just want to share that with you because uh, what you'll see tonight is I'll be weaving your role as a, as a coach slash consultant slash um, helper. Uh, and that goes from family or to business or to friends who are uh, involved in, you know, the lockdowns and the things that we're, we're doing at the moment. So I'm just going to kind of, uh, I just wanted to share that with you to begin with. So I'll be taking you on a journey and uh, we'll be visiting certain positive aspects of our world. And we'll also visit the dark side. So at some point you'll probably say, well, this is quite negative. It really isn't. Technology by its nature is neither good nor bad. Uh, usually it's there to help us. Uh, they, there's a lot of challenges around technology, um, but we're living in a world today that is, we're, we're surrounded by it. And I wanna talk about some of the challenges of our 21st century. And then I'm gonna share with you ideas uh, that will help you to thrive and be happy in our world. And so this event will be focusing on uh, awareness, observation, discernment, mindfulness, rituals, and of course the ubiquitous controlling your controllables, which, uh, the, the, which is a book I will be launching uh, very shortly. I mean, it's in the editing stage right now. So let me just take you a step back to my world. Uh, I'm uh, one of nine children born in Quebec. And the person you're looking at, the two people you're looking at on the, on the screen, uh, one is my sister, Pat, and the other one's my, my brother, Robert. Uh, now my brother, Robert, uh, passed away uh, when he was 21 years old in a, in a very tragic uh, drowning accident. And my sister, Pat, in 1983, took her life and she was bipolar. Now in our family, uh, there are remnants of, um, of uh, mental disease or mental illness. And you know there was a time when nobody wanted to talk about it. Yeah, you know, there was an era when uh, you just kind of said, okay, uh, it's a sign of weakness. I know for a fact that in today's world, uh, this is a conversation that has to go on. And if you take nothing else from this presentation, uh, if you are feeling at any time overwhelmed, there are resources available and don't be so proud or so have the, your ego to such an extent that you do not reach out for help. It will not serve you uh, to live a life of, uh, of pain. And that's what really anxiety is all about. So these two folks, uh, with my sister Pat, and we didn't even know what was, uh, you know, what was really bipolar back then. Uh, in our sense, it was just a, uh, it was, she was ill 
and she had these in tremendous highs and lows. And, uh, and that, that was just it. And then over the years, we came to realize that she wasn't the only one in the family that had that problem. And it, it stems back to, um, you know, an alcoholic family and dysfunctional family, et cetera. But that's not the reason. The reason being is that tragedy happens and our ability to deal with that is important. Um, so I just kind of want to share that with you. And then this is my daughter, Tamara. Uh, now, she lives in, in California, and she's um, in, near San Francisco. She's a lawyer. And this was a, probably her first week in the office, because this was her desk. Now, that's changed since then. Uh, but when she was in law school in Santa Clara, uh, she was dating this uh, particular individual who was also a brilliant law student, but he was a sociopath. And then one night, and I won't go into a lot of the details, but one night he tried to kidnap her and murder her. And so this, and this went on for several months. So, I mean, he was caught, uh, she was, uh, you know, by the way, as a side note, just want to share with you, if you um, don't believe in angels, um, believe me, I believe in them now because she was saved uh, during that time from this horrific thing that could have happened. And today she's doing really well and there's no issue with it. I mean, there are issues, but not in a, in a con in con or not a consequential way. Let me put it that way. So. When this happened, then I went into free fall. And um, I really went into a level of anxiety that I'd never known before. I, um, I really, um, you know, didn't sleep. I wasn't sleeping well, I wasn't eating, and I n needed help. So of course I went to see my local GP. And because he l loves the pill world, he said, here, why don't you take these pills? And then I took the, the prescription, went home, <clears throat> and um, looked and then Googled, uh, the name of the, the, the pills that he gave me and found out that he, in fact, uh, had given me this prescription without describing the side effects and there was no way I was going to take this. So I went on a search and a journey looking for uh, alternative ways to deal with my anxiety. Now, you may be sitting there watching this and saying, well, I don't have that level of anxiety, but I can almost assure you that your business clients do and, uh, and that it's your goal and should be your goal to help them, even though that may not be your exact niche that you're looking into, but if you're a consultant or a coach and you're helping people, you should be very much aware of uh, what we're living through at the moment and we'll probably continue for the next two to three years to live through. So I just want to kind of share that with you. So the primary reason for this event is to kind of live your, to raise your level of awareness in our rapidly changing world. That's one of the primary reasons. So that falls under the category of what I said earlier about being awareness, to raise your level of awareness. And the discernment part is really the ability to discern which activities and attitude that enhances or diminishes your well-being. So that discernment process is critically important to you to discern what, what kind of activities and what kind of attitude do I need and, and that I have that's of value and that will enhance what am my well-being and what do I have to get rid of to, to take away the, the things that diminish my well-being. Just bear with me here. And then mindfulness is a mental state really which is achieved by focusing one's awareness of the present moment. Mindfulness lives in the present moment and people who are really good at that and people who are really able to do that have a very high level of uh, peace and serenity. So mindfulness, just being mindful of your world, mindful of what's happening around you and you know, without engaging is a very significant part of uh, your own serenity and peace of mind. And then of course there's rituals and I'll share that with you about morning and evening rituals that bookend your day. And the reason for all of this is that so that you can surround yourself internally with a process that diminishes the anxiety you have. And you can literally, as part of a coaching program, as an entrepreneur, uh, no matter if you have a business or a, a practice, that you can share this with your clients to give them the opportunity to surround themselves with that kind of ritual process. So very important, very important to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, so I, I'm going to share with you what I do. Uh, you can you choose to use it, and I hope you do. Uh, but the significance of that is, is not to be lost. And of course, then the, the, really the centerpiece of our daily experience is controlling your controllables. What can I control? 
what is totally out of my control and why am I, why am I anxious about it? Why would it, uh, why would it bother me if I can't control it or if I can't have any influence over it? And so understanding your controllables and how that discipline enhances your well-being. So that's the kind of journey that we're walking through. Now, there are two kind of two aspects of anxiety. Uh, one of them is positive anxiety. And so the examples of a positive anxiety might be partnering with another entrepreneur or, um, or you know, affiliating yourself with someone else or joining a, another, another person to, to deliver something. Uh, that's positive anxiety. There's a level of, of you know, the, the kind of the butterflies in the stomach. As a speaker, I know all about that. I, that's my life. I don't think, I've been just speaking for 20 years. I don't think I go on stage, like even coming here and doing this presentation, I have butterflies in my stomach. Uh, they're, in, they're, in, I, I, they're in formation, but they're still there. Uh, and then adapting to COVID-19, that's positive anxiety. Whether we like it or not, we have to adapt to it. And so th that's very important to, to understand that this is a positive experience you're going through. It's what I called, I call mine Roy's excellent adventure. You call yours whatever you'd like, but put words around it that takes you to an adventure rather than something that diminishes you. And then pivoting into a new reality in your business, which you know, you're pivoting from one sequence to another or one process to another, like I've, I've had to do. I had to become very much more, um, reactive. I mean, I, my speaking career in, in a matter of a month disappeared. And then learning a new discipline such as Zoom, that also is a positive thing. Anything that takes you out of your comfort zone is creates positive anxiety. And making decisions from a place of integrity, that is what the positive anxiety that I'm referring to. And then, of course, the other type is a negative anxiety. And that is like a persistent, sad, anxious, or, or empty mood uh, feelings of guilt, worthlessness, helplessness, loss of interest or pleasure, or hobbies and activities, decreased energy, fatigue, feeling slowed down. And these are just a, a number of symptoms. There are many more. Now, I want to share this about negative symptoms, a negative anxiety and the symptoms thereof. If you, f every, I think everyone, uh, if they're really honest and above board, has moments of this feelings of guilt or worthlessness or loss of interest. Uh, other than Roger, the rest of us, we, we, uh, we tend to not, we tend to live in that world temporarily. Folks, I wanna share this with you. You know, be easy on yourself. We all go through this process. And uh, you know, you, you lose interest, you need to get your mojo back, you gotta, you've gotta do all these wonderful things. And, and, and you, you just have to accept the fact that yes, you're gonna temporarily go through them and today is probably not your best day, but you know that tomorrow is gonna be okay. So when I deliver symptoms of negative anxiety, I don't want you to say, there, oh geez, Murphy, that's me every day. Now, if it is uh, like a, a significant length of time that you're feeling this, you probably need help at some point. And or if you have friends or family or, or coworkers or clients who, who show this, because here's the, the way pivoting works now. You no longer just simply deliver a kind of work process or schedule. You literally become what I call a mini psychiatrist. I mean, you're on the lookout for people who are having issues. And so that as a, as a, as a consultant or a coach, keep an eye out on your, for your people and they will really appreciate that. And you'd be shocked if you said to them, look, I get a sense that you, you've kind of lost hope here. Uh, you'd, they'll come back to you and tell you that. And that is worth much more than giving advice on marketing or, or strategies or whatever else. We live in a very, very vulnerable age right now. So just keep in mind with your customers, are you, are you responding to that vulnerability? And, and making sure that you're connecting to them. So all of these symptoms are possible. There's more, uh, again, temporary. So where did it all begin? Well, it began in that little red spot that you see on the screen called the amygdala. Now, this is my interpretation of this. If you probably Google it, you'd get 10 other interpretations, but I'm gonna give you mine. That little white, that red circle uh, began when humanity began, when the human race began back in the, in the animal stage almost and that's always it's kind of like a memory bank and so it began there and it continues to this day every one of us have it and we have recorded memories uh, and it could be recorded memories from past 
experiences and generations, etc. But when you think of the amygdala, you should think about one word, and that is fear, because that's what it brings up. And so it began in prehistoric days. Uh, you're sitting in the cave with your family. You have to get food for them. You step out to the corner of the cave, and all the animals are waiting there to eat you. And your decision is, do I go and get food and risk the fact of getting, so, of getting eaten and rushed back to the cave, which is what you have to do? And so your entire existence was dependent on looking for negative outcomes. Like you're on, you're on the search and you're keeping visual of anything that's going on that could be harmful to you. And so over the years, the human evolution has changed. Fast forward to today. We don't have the fight or flight as it was known then. It has evolved. So we have armies to protect us. We have countries. We have a wonderful place like Canada. We have all the social elements to it. So the fight or flight that we were accustomed to back then has, for the most part, diminished. However, the one thing left is the negativity. And this has flourished. And mass media today has hijacked our psyche. And so what I'm going to share with you tonight is how to do a reset on mass media. Now, you'll find out in my presentation that I am no fan of mass media. Um, I think their motives are totally self-serving. It's all about ratings. It's all about money. And their whole role is to make our life miserable, period. That's my, my theory on it. So let's look at some of the positives of the world. Now, when you look at this, you're saying, well, how does this evolve, involve me as I am dealing with my clients? Well, your goal from this moment onward is to say, yes, there are challenges in the world. Yes, there are things that are going on in the world. But the reality of it is there are a lot of good things going on in the world. And that's what I want to focus on. So let's talk about peace. Although there are horrific hot spots in the world. And of course, with today's media, instantaneously, you get the, the big blaring story. But the reality of, the reality of it is, is that the rate of deaths from wars is 25% of what it was in the 80s, and about one seventh of what it was in the 70s. And that's since the Vietnam War. So we, as a generation, baby boomer generation has never been in a war. In fact, I say that this pandemic is our war. So I just want to kind of put that in play. Now, the reason I say all of this is that you're building in your brain a positive element and outlook to our world. That's what I want to share with you. <clears throat> when you look at this, you can confront anybody and say, yes, it's true. There's a lot of, of challenges in the world, but I want to talk about some of the more positives of the world. Life expectancy in most of human history a life expectancy was around 30 years. Now it's 71 to 80 years. In fact, in Canada, I would say that 90 to 100 years old is a commonplace situation now. I, you know, um, I've kind of, I haven't done a, a study necessarily, but I know a lot of people who are in their 90s functioning very well. Uh, and this will continue to improve because technology around, uh, around the medical world is improving. Just bear with me for a moment. <clears throat> so life expectancy has never been higher. Look at this particular graph. This is the world population living in extreme poverty. Look what it was in 1820. And look where it is in 2015, 2020. This is extreme. <clears throat> now, I want to share this with you because this is very little known and the media, God bless them, don't want to talk about it. Within the next decade, all things being equal, and pandemic is adding another whole other level to it, is we will, uh, the world will be out of extreme poverty. Extreme poverty means <clears throat> that people will have gotten a subsistence level of existence, which wasn't the case before, okay? Every day, 137,000 people escape from extreme poverty. In fact, more than a billion people just in the last two decades. And the, you know, Bill Gates and Bill and Belinda Foundation, Gates Foundation are a major push on this to get people out of extreme poverty. Look at the literate and illiterate world from, from again, 1800 to the year 2014. Look at the graph. It tells you a lot. L literate people, people who are educated, uh, bode well, and I'm, I'm referring here more to women than men, if women can get educated, we, we will live in a far, far different world in a different society. And I, I won't, that's a conversation for another day. 
uh, global child mortality. Look where that went from 40% in the 1800s to where it is today. So you, you're getting my sense there. And, and uh, 1900s, one in 10 babies died at birth. Today, one in 150 does. Again, huge advances. Infectious diseases, 700 to, in 100,000 died of infectious diseases. In 2000, 50 in 100,000. So there, we, you know, there are a lot of good things happening in the world. The challenge is a lot of people aren't talking about it. That's why my weekly newsletter is about positivity, some, some of the more positive things that are happening in our society. And I hope you join up and I'll talk, I'll talk to that later. Housing in North America in 1900, one in 100 homes had a toilet or central heating. In 2000, 97% have electricity, central heating, modern plumbing, flat screen TV, all the bells and whistles you can think of. And that's because of, the, the, of how the world is evolving. So the question comes, why are there so many unhappy, anxious people in our world today? Why is North America in a multi-billion dollar pill-popping, depressive state. Well, positivity is a long game. Positivity happens in the long term, and it doesn't have any drama. It doesn't have what we call the amygdala effect, and, me and mass media love to, to touch that amygdala and make people get hangry and paranoid, and I, I can't even describe to you how I feel about that. And, and I'm totally shocked by some of the things that go on in the media. And please remember this, 80% of the world is unconscious. 20% of the world is conscious. What does that mean? That means that the 20% of the people who are critical thinkers, like you folks on this call tonight, you are called critical thinkers. You are called the people who kind of make the discernment of what is actually, am, am I doing here and what's happening here. And so I'm, I want to speak to the 20% of the people who are conscious, who can make good decisions, who are taking control of their own world. So life is all about choice. It's about the, cho the choice that you make each and every hour of the day. And so what we have here, the answer is a lack of understanding of the very basic principles in life. Life is an inside out experience. Now, I did a trip to Africa and when I was in my 20s, and what I found in the poorest, most impoverished villages of Africa, people were deliriously happy. And I shocked the heck out of me. I said, they have absolutely nothing. Why is that happening? Why? And I remember in my 20s thinking, something is wrong with this picture. I come from a country that has every possible thing, and, and yet people are depressed and unhappy. And then that's when it dawned on me later in life, not then, because you know, in my 20s, I wasn't the smartest tack in the shed. But later on, I understood this. So here's how it goes. We were taught under our consumer world is to go, if we worked hard enough and we made enough money and we bought all the toys that we could get and all the stuff that we could store and all the things that we wanted, we would be happy. When in fact, it's the opposite. It's you are first happy with you, what you have. You're first happy with the, the world that you're living in and how you enjoy your life. And then you do the things. Now, I say this with all respect because some people are in jobs that, that may, they may or may not like. But if you're happy, you will get to your job. You'll do what you have to do. And then you'll have anything you want, which falls into the category of being happy to begin with. So you don't go from doing to having to being, you go from being to doing to having. And that's something I had to learn years later in life, is that's the way life works. We, that's why we're called human beings and not human doings. We are beings. We are present and we're being in the moment. So as entrepreneurs and micro business owners, we have arrived at the perfect storm. So here's what that looks like. First, there's disruptive technologies. Then there's artificial intelligence, which is making a big move right now on so many levels. And you know, I, can't, I, will, I won't get into it now, but it is literally machines will come to a point of being almost more uh, intelligent than the human is in certain areas. And then we have a voracious um, negative media, addiction to social media and devices and exponential speed. This is a perfect storm 
to disrupt almost any human's experience. Now, if I were in your shoes, which I am, because I am a coach, entrepreneur, I'm a, um, a consultant, I'm looking at this world and I'm saying, how can I look at this as being an opportunity for me to talk to people who are conscious of this, but not don't quite get a full grasp of the whole picture? So when you start looking at this, you start saying, there is a massive opportunity here to reach out to people. And even though you might say to yourself, well, yeah, but I need to eat. Yes, I get, I understand that. But this is like the big picture of what that perfect storm looks like. So let's look at Uber, software company. They don't own any cars and are now one of the largest taxi companies in the world. So if, you, if your parents or your brother is a taxi driver, they're kind of looking at their world a whole lot differently. Airbnb is a software company and they have become one of the biggest hotel companies in the world, although they don't own any properties. That's part of disruptive technology. By the way, there are tons of disruptive technologies today. Uh, Amazon being another, um, you know, disruptive. Anything that, that's going on in the world, they're at the forefront. Electric cars. As a matter of fact, I read today that, that the gentleman who owns Tesla just surpassed William, um, um, Buffett as the wealthiest man in the world because people are seeing what's happening. So electrical cars will become mainstream about 2022, which means cities will be less noisy. Uh, people and the COVID will have changed that again because that will add another kind of disruptive technology, namely what we're on today called Zoom. That will allow more people to work from home, more connection, people will travel less. So you get the drift of what I'm trying to say. This is a, a wonderful cartoon. Pedicure is booming, but manicure is dead because people are perpetually on their machines. Or I feel naked without my phone. How many of you in the audience have felt naked without your phone? Or remember when it used to be eat with veggies or you won't get any dessert? Eat those veggies or I'll change the path, Wi-Fi password. <laughs> I mean, here's another, and now talk about disruptive technologies and the gentleman who was on earlier talking about, you know, um, online education. I mean, he's on the right track. I mean, this is it. He knows how to read and write. We just want to learn how to speak because these kids, that's, that's their world. Look, this kid in that you see in the picture is, you know, you go down the street and you see four and five-year-olds with, with their handheld devices. That speaks to everything. It's called a book, not sure where the batteries go. We're not too far away from that. Now, how many of you have been here? Now, if you can find the power switch, flip it on. I have to tell you that I uh, spent uh, about uh, two hours yesterday and an hour the day before with TELUS solving a problem that they caused. How many of you have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours dealing with technology that a company didn't quite figure out and that you are the only one. Uh, now, now you're the guinea pig trying to make their system better. It drives me crazy. And here's another one, I, you know, uh, typical guys on his computer. That's where he lives. Or now this is a bit drastic, but how many of you have kind of fallen into this trap or someone else has that you might know who are, don't know how the internet changed their lives. No, no uh, exercise, no kind of quality of life, no way of, of uh, having a life balance. Folks, if you're an a entrepreneur, a consultant, a coach, look at this. This is what people are desperate for. And if you can nail this, you are on your way, really, because you can teach people how to, to change their lifestyle. And then there's this, of course, and I, uh, I was, uh, this was a couple of years back, I was at UBC, and the, this is people who are walking around, running into other people as they're on their devices, which drive me crazy. I was at UBC going to see a friend in the hospital there, and uh, the security guard was in some fresh cement, was guarding some fresh cement on the sidewalk, and I said, why are you standing here? And she said, because two people yesterday, because they're on their stupid handheld devices, walked into the cement because there was only a small one, one kind of cone there and walked in up, almost up to their ankles in the cement. We had to redo it, and I'm here because of that. So that tells you a lot. So I want you to think about this, folks. It's called the fear of missing out. 
you get over it. You will never catch up. Get used to it. Be cool and let your, listen, if it's serious enough, all your friends will tell you about it and there is no shame in not knowing. In fact, Warren Buffett said, just say, I don't know. Everybody thinks, well, I, I'll miss something. You're not missing anything. If it's that serious, they'll tell you about it. They'll be so thrilled to tell you that you missed out on it. Just accept the fact that uh, you, don't, you can't know everything and that will lower your anxiety dramatically. And of course, then we have the voracious negative media, 24-hour cable news, dumbed down news messages. This is like the dumbest down to the point that people, they are treating the news as entertainment. You should have figured that out by now. When the news comes on, and particular US networks, CBC not so much, CTV not so much, but cable news, it's, an, it's insane. And celebrity rules. So it's a race to the bottom. So here's what I've done. I don't watch CNBC, MSNBC. I don't watch Fox. I don't watch any of this. And because I, I don't need to know, and furthermore, it doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve me. And I am one of the people who can internalize negativity if I, if I let it get to me. You know, I'll watch this and go, the world's going to hell in the handbasket here, which is not the case. So social media should be called electronic media and not social media. Now, for all of you who are on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and whatever other is going on, uh, God bless you. And I know that you're connecting to friends that you hadn't seen before. I have a wonderful slide, which I couldn't find today. It was a, it was a funeral home. And this casket's laid out and three people are in the viewing audience. And the woman's standing behind and she says, you know, I, I'm really surprised. He has 8,400 likes on Facebook. I expected a bigger turnout. And I want you to think about that. The reality is that social media today, particularly Facebook, is, is, a, is a kind of a display of hatred. Uh, and, you know, nobody's taking care of business here. What I'm saying is be a critical thinker. And, you know, I'm, I'm not against, look, I, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. But I'm just there to, and, and, you, and Twitter, I'm just there uh, because of my business, because a lot of my clients are there. But I do not live there permanently, I can tell you that. And so specific positives are, are, for business are okay. As I said previously, there is no bad about anything. It's good, neither good nor bad. It's how you use it, it's how you engage with it, and it can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And human connection trumps electronic uh, connection every single day. That's the, that's the whole part of this. We are a species who craves connection to other people, and we want to be part of that. So all this kind of media is like lemmings, and so it's like snake charmers. They get put out a message. It, it appeals to your, your, your worst instincts, and so that results in this. And I don't know about you, and I'm not making any political comment here, but you can draw your own conclusions about what that looks like. Now, I want to share this with you because this was incredibly important to me. Um, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm building a, not a negative case, but I want to just kind of make you realize how, how we are led in certain directions. So this was a, a several years ago, and there was a mosque incident in Quebec where this guy went in with a rifle and he shot a bunch of people a mentally deranged gunman. I mean, no, no sane human being picks up a rifle and does that. So the CBC did a breathless rendition for seven days. We're talking interviews with family, with friends, with PhDs, cab drivers, politicians, you name it, they were asking questions and they were all lamenting. Now, I wanna be fair to, I wanna be right up front. Any loss of life anywhere is tragic. It's disgusting. It is, it should never happen and regrettably it happens. And you know, the family, look, in my case with my daughter, I was incredibly lucky and she was incredibly lucky to get out of that. And if something would have happened to her, I would not have want the media pounding on my door asking me stupid questions. I would have wanted the time to do what I had to do, mourn and do whatever. So this kind of thing that I'm showing you now represents a total, I mean, uh, uh, you know, abdication of humanity. And so the coverage of the funeral, blah, blah, blah. And it just never ended for seven complete days. 
So I want to ask you, are you suffering from issue fatigue? So what I'm going to share with you is an experiment I did over one week. Okay. And again, I don't want to make this a negative thing, but I want you to understand how we can be affected by this. Now, whether you get it from social media or whether you get it from your local television, however you get your information, for God's sake, just keep in mind what this can do to you. So this is a recent CBC headline. So I chose to, over a complete week, underline all of the different things on the media that were negative. Okay, and no positives here. So you see down this list, oil to markets, Russia reopened, blah, blah, blah. So here we go. ISIS, Kinder Morgan, depleted uh, groundwater, Russian meddling, identi identity crisis, Donald Trump, Saudi, you know, went on and on. That wasn't all of it. Here's the rest of it. That's in one week. Now, after you've seen this, and I'm not going to read these two, you can read them yourselves. After you've seen this, you say to yourself, oh my God, what does this mean? So here's what this means. This is your emotional and spiritual and mental psyche with this kind of issue fatigue. You're leaking all over the place. And I, I arrived at a point of saying, I'm going to protect my world. I am going to protect. And you, as an entrepreneur, I'm telling you, encourage your clients to protect their world. Pivot to that process. It's what everybody needs now. They, they, they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know what to do with it. And I, if I were, you know, in your shoes, I would look at this soon. Now, don't change what you're doing in terms of what your offering is, but remember to approach clients well, on the basis of, I'm here to help you emotionally, mentally, and spiritually if you can, but mostly emotionally and mentally. Because a lot of, a lot of customers today of your clients and the ones you're chasing have a mo mental and emotional process they're going through that is not helping them in a lot of cases. So a lot of people feel like this. They're overwhelmed. They've got so much coming at them, which makes you want to do this. Stick your head in the sand and hope that maybe if I stick my head in the sand and wait for two years, all of this will go away and the normal will come back. It ain't coming back. That's for sure. Roger, are there any questions that anybody has anywhere? I can't hear you. You're, you're muted. Uh, there's lots of discussion in the chat, but uh, you're doing such a thorough job that nobody has any questions. Keep oh, my on, gosh. Keep on okay. trucking. Okay. Very well. So that, that's what I want you to do, is to, um, is to stick your head in the sand. So we as a species are not hardwired to assimilate this unpredictability and this speed of change. That's, we're just not, that's not our nature. We, and I speak from, because I'm old, uh, coming up through my career and uh, to the age that I am now, we could take certain changes that were going on and we could assimilate them easily enough into our world and nobody was under any pressure to do differently. But today there is such a high level of unpredictability and we as a human species, we love speed. We love the fastest car. How many of you have actually said, my computer is not fast enough. I need more speed in my computer. And this thing is so slow. That's the natural ability. We want speed. How fast can I get there? Daddy, when am I getting there? Daddy, when are we going to get there? Well, I want to be there. And not only daddy, but we as a human species, our whole world. So we are the culprits behind the speed of change. Seldom do you say, I want to look, let's slow down my my internet connection here it's a little bit too slow for me no it's the opposite so that's the part the process of it so the Are you, you, uh, you have a question uh it's uh, from uh, krishna any tips on breaking the habits and he's particularly talking about kids addicted to social media yes L let me deal with that right now there is no singular answer to this for the same reason that I get, I only answer emails toward the end of the day. Uh, people who are addicted to social media, the, you know, it's almost like cold turkey. You have to find a coach who does this, who will keep you accountable or find a, a friend. If you have a friend who is in the same boat as you are and you are, you, you are accountable to each other and you say, 
Okay. Uh, you know, I am going to be on social media for one hour a day, choose whatever time you want, and that you support each other in that process. And you have a conversation. It's almost like a, re, a, re, um, a support group. There is no singular answer to this. I mean, you've, you've just got to literally say, I'm spending too much darn time wasting time on this. And then you make a decision and you find a support group. Uh, I should start one of those actually. Um, a support group around people who want to get off email or get off social media and, and not, not eliminate it completely, but just have very structured times that you get on there. So I hope that answers this question. Um, but there is no singular panacea that you can say, uh, flip a switch and uh, there we are. So, um, so the strategy for the few, I've been preaching this now for, for almost 15 years, and I'm not kidding you. The future is about how much information, not about how much information we can acquire, but how much information we can keep out. Folks, tell your children, tell your family, tell your coworkers, tell your clients. If they need it, if they need an answer to anything, they can go on and Google and Google it and get a direct answer or go on YouTube. YouTube has every bit, you, you put anything in there, somebody's done it and they put a video up about it. So you don't need that kind of information. What you need is a, a higher level of awareness, sensitivity to, to creativity and innovation, but you do not need more information, excuse me. So it's about keeping information out, <clears throat> keeping social media out, um, not, not having what I call the shiny object syndrome. How many people here suffer from the, the shiny object syndrome? Something new. Look, I've done it. I've got more courses that I paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars for that sat, sit on my computer right now that I've never used. So remember this, be specific, be critical about what you're doing and keep the information as much as you possible out of it. Get, get off um, having signed up for all kinds of other stuff except my newsletter, uh, but uh, anything else that's out there, uh, get rid of it. So the idea is you stand in the middle of the hurricane. It's that, that's the eye of the hurricane, right there. Now I don't have a dog here. Do you have a dog there, Car uh, Roger? I'm afraid there's a dog walking on Beach Avenue right now, but he's moved on to the hot dog stand. Okay. <laughs> so you are standing in the middle of that hurricane with the world swirling around you and you are protecting yourself from all of these other uh, media, whatever it is that is your favorite form of suffering. Write that down. What is your favorite form of suffering? and get rid of it. So the highest priority is developing a mindful med meditation routine. Now, I, I remember saying to Roger, and I think he may have included in this in the, the preamble to my talk, if you do nothing else, if you already have a, a meditation routine, keep at it. If you've never developed a, a, a me meditation routine, it's time. Meditation is like a muscle. The more you do it, the better you get at it, the better it works for you, and you will diminish any anxiety. You have not only diminished your anxiety, but you will elevate your level of happiness and joy and well-being. So the, develop a mindful meditation routine um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what mine is in a few moments. And then here's the magic question, because here's what happens when you're, when you're doing meditation. Your mind's playing tricks on you. Your mind is saying, oh, well, I, did I turn the stove off? Uh, you know, why did he, did he say that to me? Why didn't he say this to me? Why did she do this to me? Why, why am I doing this? What's going on? And so the magic question is, I wonder what my next thought will be. Now, why is that significant? Because your brain will come to a screeching halt. You've asked a question about a next thought and your brain has to stop and think about what is my next thought? And all during your meditation, if you find that your brain is scrambling, you say, I wonder what my next thought will be. 
and it will immediately trigger you back to the present moment. So if you, again, a very interesting way when you meditate, because, you know, we all sit there and we have that kind of little gremlin on our shoulder telling us that we should be somewhere else and we should be doing something much more productive or more fun. And then you say, I wonder what my next thought will be. I remember when I first started doing that, I would laugh because it was so silly that I, what I was thinking at the time. So why mindful meditation? Because it calms, calms the mind and it calms the spirit and allows you to build your emotional, mental, and spiritual bank account. Now, that is significant because what happens is as we go through life, there will be opportunities and there will be scenarios that arrive which will tax your emotional, mental, and spiritual bank account. And so it could be a tragedy, it could be a, a business failure, it could be almost anything. And the more that you can, when you get into that meditative state, it allows you to build that, that what I call the firewall. And it allows you also to live in the moment, which is where everybody should be, is living in the moment. And I know there are certain people uh, were saying earlier that they're anxious about the future and they're anxious about what's going to be coming up. And I'm not diminishing anything, so please understand that this does not mean that I'm, I'm, I'm by any means diminishing anything that you're saying. I know you're probably thinking, well, what about me? Um, and I'm different. Living in the moment is the key here. So here's where anxiety strives. Roy, can you take a question? Sure. From Van, uh, how do I know if I'm incorporating meditation in my workout? Well, um, Okay, so I'm not, is it a workout he's doing, that's something, a workout physically? Van, why don't you unmute and ask Roy your question? Yeah, so that starts with a question, as in like I usually wake up early and go work out either running, lifting weights, or just uh, rope jumping. And then I was wondering if that is considered a form of meditation, meditation? And if so, how do I know whether or not I am in co like meditation during workout? Is that an incorporation into the workout or the workout itself becomes the meditation? No, um, then the key to it is, is that you wake up in the, I, I have my schedule that I'm gonna be coming up and I'll show you what, it, what my schedule is. You do all of you, you do your meditation, you read from a, an inspirational book, and you write in a journal, and then you do your workout. So the, it's a three-step process, and I, I come to that in a few moments. I'm going to share with you what I do, which is, will address exactly what you're referring to. Okay, I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, in the, so here's where anxiety thrives. In the past, where we spend our time doing woulda, shoulda, coulda world, and we're beating ourselves up. How many people have done that? I, would have, I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd have done that. Why didn't I do that differently? Why didn't I answer? Why didn't I respond that, that way? How could I be so stupid that I didn't tell that person that? And uh, particularly as you get older, it's on the drive home that you suddenly remember all the names and the ideas that you had when you're a certain age. Or people live in the future, which is we play out every dream of catastrophes and disasters and calamities. And I would venture to say with, us, with some exceptions that 90% of the disasters you thought were going to come up never actually happened. So here's the, this, is, this is where anxiety lives all the time, in the past and in the future. And that's why it's so important to live in the moment because you can, you can drive yourself crazy with all this stuff. So just put that in the back of my again come back to your customers remember where they're coming from when you meet a, when you're a coach or a consultant and you go to them and you say tell me what you you're you're living well yes but next month i won't be able to pay the rent and or i won't be able to do this what can you do right now so i'm just kind of giving you a, a kind of a, a, a head start on identifying for that customer exactly what that looks like telling them basically live in the moment and anxiety does not thrive in the present moment at all. So don't judge, just observe. Now this is important because I am a judgmental person and I can drive down the street and I can have more judgments on people driving and people walking and people doing this and doing that. I have to tell you a very funny story. One time my daughter was about 12, 13 years old and we're driving down Kingsway 
and um, and so we're in the car and we're driving along and this guy's come walking by, you know, the overalls that used to have the crotch down around the knees and the chains around the, you know, out of his uh, belt buckle and everything else going on and the real schlep. So I said to her, and I said, sweetheart, do you see that guy right over there? If you ever show up with someone like that in our home, I will shoot both of you. And that was an ongoing <laughs> joke forever about, about not being judgmental. And, you know, I didn't know who that, and I could tell you stories about, about having made judgments about people and things and without having prior knowledge and suddenly realize, you know what, I was totally wrong. So key to the, for that is don't judge anything. Just observe what's happening in the world. You'll be far better off. So what to do? Well, you become proactive. You leverage your personal influence. You start small, you connect to your community, you develop daily routines and rituals. So let's get started. How? By analyzing your immediate world. Where do you have control? Now, I've got some, you know, uh, some um, breaking news for you. You have very little control almost over anything. You can control what goes on between these two things, your ears, and what can you influence? You can influence your family and your community, depending on what level you're at. And how do you do that? By keeping perspective. And keeping perspective is the ability to perceive things in their actual interrelations or comparative importance. I tried to keep my perspective through the COVID crisis. Perspective. And common sense enables perspective. So does gratitude, being grateful for what you have. So does contribution. That gives you a level of perspective. And so does love. Love enables perspective. And when you look at the world, that's where we need more of is love and contribution and gratitude and common sense. So when I see somebody saying, well, yeah, did you read about the murder in Port Coquitlam or somebody killed somebody here or they, these people did something terrible? I always say in a community of X number of thousands of citizens, what are the chances that there are a number of sociopaths walking among us wanting to do harm, period. So you look at, a, you get a perspective on what, the beauty of it is 99% of p the people in any community live together. That's the miracle. That's a miracle right there. That people actually coexist. They may not like each other all the time, but they coexist. So the perspective question is important. When you see a news item or you see something that, that troubling, you say, what are the chances of this happening? And that's, that's how I keep perspective a lot of the time. So what can we control? What resources do we have? What talent do we have? So here it is. So here's a sphere of influence. You start out with self, you move to family, then to community, and then into the world. So the first one is self and family. So that's your sphere of influence. And I know for a fact that if you have children, and in any one of you, that how you have interacted in your life with your fellow fam family members, how you have spoken, how you have uh, you know, uh, expressed your point of view will directly reflect on children because they're always listening and they're sponges. So the first two spheres of influence are self and family. And, and really, your first sphere is you. What do you do with your free will? What are your core values? How do you protect <coughs> your mind? How, why would someone leave why would you leave your world in someone else's hands? And if so, why are you permitting that favorite form of suffering? You notice that was a comment I made earlier. So who are you and from a personal core values? I did not write out my core values till I was almost 65 years old. Now I knew them in 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 instinctively, but I did not know, I did not have them written out. And then I went to a conference in LA and someone was talking about it and I, he said, write them out. So what do you believe in? What do you stand for? And what are your no compromise values? So here's mine. Uh, now these are on my website. These are all around my home. Um, my wife knows what they are. My daughter knows what they are. Deliver well through service. That's more business, but uh, I'm, I'm right there. Treat others as you'd want to be treated. Give back to the community and the world. I'm a Rotarian. That's why I have that as part of my core values. Live with passion, have vision, be grateful, be humble, under promise, over deliver, be accountable, take responsibility, remain on the learning curve and have fun and create a family spirit. Those are mine. 
I suggest you find your own and, and decide what you, what you believe in. And if you can put pen to paper, that's even a lot better. <clears throat> so let's come back again. What online news do you watch? What newspapers do you read? Uh, don't, you don't avoid negative friends, you run from negative friends and make sure they're no longer friends after tonight. Control your controllables and what are they? Well, here's some examples of controllables. TV watching, newspapers, the news, friends who, you know, that's, you control your, 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 your environment with friends, handheld devices, social media, physical exercise, sleep, diet, all of these things are within your realm of control. And if you don't control it, someone else will. You can rest assured they will. And that's what media does. And that's why social media does, because they, they have that, uh, the triggers, what we call the, the psychological triggers involved. So does this resonate? Is what I am doing enhancing or diminishing my well-being? That should be your comment all the time. What am I doing that's enhancing my well-being and what's diminishing it? Again, I repeated earlier, I, this is my mantra. I don't judge, I just observe. Second sphere, family, speaking perspective, leading by example. I did that with my daughter uh, and, and, and she is who she is today because of my parenting and her mother, but my, my parenting too. Do you know your role and have you abdicated your role? In, so under the second sphere of influence, your family is very, very important. And then of course, community. Your community, are you supporting each other? Are you leading by example? No, the helper thing came from, from Mr. Rogers, who is one of, I consider one of my heroes. And he said, in any tragedy, look for the helpers, support the helpers, be part of the helper community. That's how you live your life. Not by knocking people down, by who are the helpers. In a COVID world, front, front, front lines uh, people, the first responders, all of these, these are the helpers. That's why we support them. And we have to do a better job of even doing that, uh, you know, without COVID, we should be help, you know, being a helper. And are you giving back? That's the third sphere. And that is the contribution factor. So we are 36 million people in this country in a sea of 7.2 billion. We have access to the best of the best and we have unimaginable freedom and I say to you, be grateful. And gratitude, I make a gratitude list every day. I have a book is in the living room. Every night before I go to bed, I sit down and I write seven things that I'm grateful for that day. It takes five, six minutes to do it. I've gotten really good at it. You can repeat some of them, uh, but you start to look at your day and saying, what am I grateful for today? And gratitude is everything. You, I suggest you start your gratitude journal now write it daily, morning and night. I tend to, I can do one or the other. I don't do it every morning and every night combined, but I certainly do it at least once a day. I, I'm perpetually looking for daily events that I can be grateful for. And then I express gratitude to everyone you know. And, and when you know my world, I speak on cruise ships. I get up in front of an audience and say, I live in a perpetual state of gratitude. And I say that to everybody and I mean it. So that's your highest priority is get a journal and write down what you're grateful for. You want to lower your anxiety? You want to get a better feeling for your life? This is what I recommend. And it counterbalances negativity. It builds your mental, emotional, and spiritual bank account. It fortifies you in times of struggle and disaster. And it brings mindfulness into your day-long activities. So that's why you have a gratitude journal. Any other questions, Roger? A uh, question from Barbara, why seven? I do this daily. Um, I, it's just a number I chose. Usually I do five of things that I am, um, that I am grateful for. And then the two are related to a project or a goal that I have, where I have found some intuitive thing around that goal. And, the, and so the, the last two, the two, the, the number six and number seven are usually related to um, something I'm grateful for that I found that's related to my my uh, goals that I have. No, you can you do five, you can do three. There's no set rule for them. Um, and the world, are you giving back to the world again? Your your whatever works for you. Um, are you leading by example, and are you demonstrating perspective in as it goes to the world? 
and as you're viewing the world. So that sphere of influence is, is way beyond your ability to control, uh, but it's just how you view the world and how you engage uh, at whatever level and you give to charities that are important to you. Um, I do Salvation, I give money to Salvation Army because their world is different. And, um, and so you have to make that distinction. So here's my ritual to the, to the folks who wanted to know what I do. I'm usually up at 6.30, um, you know, it could be seven o'clock, but anyhow, it's, uh, I do a 15 minute meditation. Then I read from an inspirational book for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then I write in my journal for five minutes. And then I do my workout or exercising. That is my morning ritual. Now, do I miss it sometimes? Yes, I do. Why? Because I'm lazy. Uh, but I would say 95% of the time, this is what I do. Um, and we're rarely, now if I travel a lot, which I haven't been doing now for months, uh, this is a pretty steady routine that I have. And it works for me. You might have to uh, do your, whatever whatever it works for you. And then the evening one is around 9.30. I, I do a 15-minute meditation again. Uh, I read from an inspirational book. And then I write in my gratitude journal, book ending my day. So in the morning, I'm grateful. In the evening, I've kind of reviewed the day and I write five. Now, again, it, whatever works for you. Uh, and and the important to do a meditation, particularly if you've been watching, uh, like we watch not a lot of Netflix and some of the programming is a little bit rough. I, I find that by meditating in the evening, I can sleep a lot better. Here's some anxiety busters. And, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm at 60 minutes, Roger. So I only have a few more minutes to go. Do not give oxygen to negativity. That's enough, you know, don't, don't have conversations about a lot of negative stuff. Don't give oxygen to it. Your words determine your reality and, your, and what you're thinking about. Be careful with your words, the power of thoughts, and your, your, your thoughts determine the quality of your life. So whatever you speak to generally follows what you are actually doing in your life. So I'm very, very conscious of words. Um, and so depending, you know, really understand what your language is all about. Um, avoid comparisonitis. Never judge another person's inside, outside with your inside. So no, just because somebody looks like they're, they're world famous and looks like they're doing all kinds, no, don't compare yourself to anybody. Live your life. Avoid comparing yourself to other people. And practice selective ignorance. I don't know, I don't need to know. If I want it, I can find it. So, you know, just leave me alone with my ignorance. I can figure it out if I need it and I can know where to go to look if I want. So practice selective ignorance. And avoid the FOMO syndrome, fear of missing out. You will miss out on a lot of stuff and, and God bless you, you should. Not everybody, you should never be trying to catch up to anything. It doesn't work and you'll drive yourself crazy. Practicing is hugging as often as possible, except in the time of COVID. I'm French, so I hug anything, trees, dogs, people, cats, anything I can grab. So you can imagine my level of, uh, of alienation at the moment is uh, pretty astounding. So practice hugging as often as possible. Get back to your community. Be grateful. Love your family. Practice mindful meditation. Uh, get a perspective. Here's a wrap up. Get a perspective. Meditate twice a day if you can. Be forever grateful. Control your controllables. Be a helper and support them in your community. Avoid negative triggers and your favorite form of suffering. Be proactive in your community. Make a difference. Love is the answer and be cool. Now, my offer is this. I'm writing a book right now on Control Your Controllables, Seven Steps to a Life of Serenity and Peace. It's in, it's in the uh, stay editing stage. If you will go to my website, sign up for my weekly newsletter. By the way, that weekly newsletter comes out every Tuesday morning, most of the time, and it's about positivity. And I glean a whole lot of positive stuff and I put it in there and Roger's on my list so he can attest to that. Um, and it's, um, it's a, it's, that's my offer to you. It's a simple offer. Uh, when the book comes, becomes available, uh, I'll offer it to my tribe and you'll be part of my tribe. And there we go. And here I leave you with this. I've learned that people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I hope I have made you feel better as of to this moment. So there we are. Thank you, Roger. Roy, in uh, 10 years of uh, 
Vancouver that, Business Network. That talk was probably one of the most uplifting and positive talks from any speaker. Oh my. Over around about 600 events. However, we are over time. I have to thank you on behalf of BBN, and then I have to love you and leave you. Good okay. night and thank you. Uh, attendees, thank you for the time and the trust you have demonstrated by choosing to spend your uh, Tuesday evening with uh, Roy Prevost and myself, Roger Killen. Good night.